I'd like to start off with uh, the beginning where it's the early 20th century and we have CFCs, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, which is a difficult word to say. Um, and they're in quite a lot of our manufacturing and commercial goods. So I'm curious if you could start there by just explaining um, what CFCs are and what their role was in the early 20th century. Well, they weren't actually uh, discovered until I think around the 20s, if I recall. Maybe Stephen can correct me on that. But uh, they were uh, initially used um, in uh, air conditioning. So that was a, a great advance over using things like ammonia, which is toxic and explosive and all kinds of horrible things. And the great thing about the CFCs is that they're non-toxic, at least when you breathe them, although they're very toxic to the ozone layer, they're not toxic to you directly. And uh, they became really widespread in use, though, when they began to be used as spray cans in aerosol propellants. And that didn't really happen until somewhat later. I think that the spray can business really started exploding uh, in the, in the post-World War II era, probably in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and then uh, it was discovered that these things have very long lifetimes in the atmosphere. They live, depending on which one you talk about, for some 50 to 100 years. So that is just staggering because what it means is that every year, whatever we put in, almost all of it will still be there the next year. And it'll just pile up and pile up and pile up. So initially, a few people who worked on it thought, hey, this is great. It's a terrific tracer for atmospheric motion. How cool is that? But it turned out that although that's somewhat true in the lower atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere, they actually break down and make chlorine atoms, and those chlorine atoms can go on to uh, destroy ozone. And, and we first became aware of this through some wonderful work by uh, Molina and Rowland in the mid-70s, which later won the, the Nobel Prize for uh, chemistry, along with Paul Crutzen. I could circle back on a little of the details of the technology if you'd like. Sure, go for it, Steve. The year was in the 20s, 1929, and it was invented by Thomas Midgley, who was working for Frigidaire Division of General Motors. And just as uh, Susan said, this was viewed as a, a wonder chemical because uh, the chemicals at that time were things like methylene chloride and ammonia and even gasoline as a refrigerant. So it was very dangerous, there were lots of injuries, uh, by that time, America's waters were polluted, so it was difficult to use ice from ponds. And so it was immediately commercialized to replace these flammable and toxic refrigerants. And then just as Susan said, uh, the companies that produced it slowly looked at other markets. Aerosols starting with pesticides for soldiers in World War II, and then finding a commercial market, and then solvents because it's a very effective solvent for electronics and aerospace. And then there were other uses that came along, such as making rigid and flexible foam. And then finally, towards the end, there were elegant uses, such as hospital sterilization and as the aerosol for meter dose inhalers that are used for asthma patients. So it had extraordinary uses, and it was not appreciated until 1974 when Mario Molina and Sherry Rowland discovered that these chemicals could des destroy the ozone layer. Before we get to Molina and Rowland, uh, I was curious if we could actually start with James Lovelock, um, because, you know, we're releasing and creating all of these CFCs, um, and it seems like he's the first person who actually takes a look at, at these things in the atmosphere. So could, could you explain James Lovelock's role in this story? Sure. He invented the gas chromatograph and made a lot of money off of it and became independently wealthy because it's a very useful instrument for measuring all kinds of things. And he took it on a, uh, he was British, and he took it on a British research vessel and sailed from the northern hemisphere down to almost the Antarctic and showed that uh, he could understand exactly what the distribution of the CFC that he was measuring uh, was, 
based on the amount that had been uh, emitted. And he said, oh, isn't that cool? It's a great tracer for atmospheric motion, as I mentioned before. So, um, and in fact, I, I'm pretty sure in, in his paper, there is some kind of sentence like, this couldn't ever conceivably pose any hazard because it's so non-toxic. Um, but of course, having less of an ozone layer is not good for life on the planet because ozone absorbs ultraviolet light that uh, is very, very important for protecting us from uh, uh, sunburn and cataracts and protecting animals and plants and all kinds of things. So depletion of the ozone layer uh, is actually a threat to both humanity and the planet. I do want to say it wasn't until somewhat later, 1985, when scientists from the British Antarctic Survey actually discovered the ozone hole. And uh, what they were doing was measuring total ozone in the Antarctic. They'd been doing it since the 1950s. And they were able to show that sometime around the late 70s, it started dropping like a rock. Way more ozone depletion than Molina and Rowland had ever imagined. So it turns out that these chlorofluorochemicals are actually even more damaging to the ozone layer in the Antarctic, uh, and, and actually it also to some extent at mid-latitudes, as we now know, um, than, than we originally thought. So it's been sort of a cautionary tale of don't be too sanguine about any chemical made in the lab. You know, when you make something in the lab that nature doesn't make, I think you should always do a double take, especially if it has a very long atmospheric lifetime. And, and builds up in the way that I described. So you, that means you can't get rid of it if you stop uh, using it. You, you can eventually, but it's going to take a long time for the atmosphere to cleanse itself. Could you explain why, why James uh, Lovelock was initially interested in, in CFCs and you know, what his investigation led to scientifically? As far as I know, he really just wanted to... Um, see what their distribution was like to get some sort of a handle on uh, what they might be, what his instrument might be useful for. I don't actually know of a use beyond that. Do you, Stephen? You know, I think that's right. He was looking for gases that were indicators, as you suggest, and of course he had a device that would measure other chemicals, but I think he was uh, immediately struck by the fact that he was seeing the same chemical at all locations that he sampled. And then he uh, made the natural connection of saying, where did this co uh, chemical originate and how long did it take to mix in the lower atmosphere? So I think it was a, a good, solid scientific inquiry of a very intelligent person with a new instrument. Maybe we should clarify. I, I said uh, he went all the way down almost to the Antarctic, but I neglected to underscore that of course there is no chlorofluorocarbon emission in the Antarctic, right? I mean, at that time there was nobody even, there were no stations, there was nobody there. So any chlorofluorocarbon that could get there had to have gotten there by atmospheric transport. And it would also tell you that it has to have a fairly long lifetime because you know if you emit, um, oh, let's just say sulfur dioxide from a power plant in the Ohio Valley, yeah, I mean, it's a serious issue. It can, cost, it can cause acid rain, it can cause little particles that are bad for your lungs, it does a lot of bad things, but it's not gonna be found in the Antarctic. It, you know, it, it just doesn't have that long of a lifetime, it rains out. So this proved that they were a great tracer. In his mind, I think that's, that's what he was attracted by. We're in this world where CFCs are basically being used for a ton of different applications. Um, our current understanding at that time was that they were non-reactive and non-toxic. So basically a, a wonder a wonder chemical that could be used for all sorts of things and was much safer than the kinds of chemicals that we were using at the same time. Uh, and here comes uh, James Lovelock, who um, f from my reading, it seemed like he first got interested in it because his view from his house was hazy. And he didn't know why it was hazy, and he wanted to figure out if it, like, if it were uh, uh, man-made chem chemicals or you know what this pollution that was obscuring his vision was. Um, and so he starts measuring all these CFCs everywhere. Um, and now we're in a world where it seems very clear that 
the CFCs are abundant in the the lower atmosphere. So let's start to pivot into um, Mario Molina and Frank Rowland's role in this story and how we begin to move from noticing that there are so many CFCs in the atmosphere to finding out that there might be a problem. Well, I will say that uh, Dr. Rowland has passed away, unfortunately. Uh, so has Molina more recently. But uh, he never went by Frank. He went by Sherry. His name was indeed F. Sher Sherwood Rowland, but he was known to everyone as Sherry Rowland. So go ahead, Steve. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. The, the story of it is is actually a, another great science story. Mario Molina had finished his doctor's degree at University of California, Berkeley, and had taken a postdoctorate study with Sherry Rowland at University of California, Irvine, and they looked at four or five interesting topics. And I think that the, the history is that Molina saw this one as being particularly intriguing, even though it was slightly outside either of their expertise. So it was a stretch for them, but it gave them a chance to look at something that could be potentially uh, very important. And then the story is that as they began to investigate, it started to seem more and more obvious to them. And it became uh, a rush uh, for conclusion because they were worried about the effect of their work. Uh, there's one story that uh, Sherry Rowland tells that he was he came home from work one day and his wife Joan asked, how did your day go? How is your work? And he replied something like, well, the work is fantastic but I think the earth is ending. So it was, uh, you can imagine uh, the tension, the creative tension. And then they published their article in, I think in April of 1974, and there was no uptake by the press. There was no scientific uh, confirmation. It was a quiet time until that fall, the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, saw this, a scientist there, and recognized this was a big public policy issue. So at the American Chemical Society fall meeting, they had a presentation by Merlina and Roland. And then by the best of good luck of ruthless corporate behavior, the industry attacked them and made the scientific study newsworthy. So this was a tremendous good fortune, oddly enough, because then all the press was asking what are you talking about? Why is it important? And what could happen? And that cultivated in Molina and Roland the ambition and, and uh, Sherry Roland called for a ban on aerosol cosmetic products, hairspray and deodorants. And so this was stepping out of the role of a normal scientist and becoming an activist. And of course, there was a boycott uh, that was quite spectacularly successful in the United States and then some product bans. And I, actually, I just want to say, I think we should be proud in the U.S. that there was uh, a consumer boycott. I mean, people turned away from spray cans. And that actually, interestingly enough, did not happen in Europe. Uh, they kept using them. So we, we can look back on that time as one in which people were uh, environmentally very aware in this country. Uh, not just on uh, the issue of uh, the ozone layer, but but also for things like photo, you know, like smog uh, and, and uh, clean water. All those issues had attracted a lot of attention right around this time. I I will uh, also say that it's interesting that the at the time of the Moline and Roland work, they were talking about the fact that from the best of our understanding of the day, in a hundred years, we might see a few percent decrease in the total amount of ozone. So kind of a small effect, far in the future, kind of like the way some people used to talk about climate change until maybe this year or the last few. And uh, um, the Antarctic ozone hole was a huge wake-up call because what they found uh, was that ozone had dropped by more than 30% over Antarctica already by 1985, something that no one had anticipated. So it was a huge shock to the science community. And at first, uh, a fair number of people didn't really take it seriously. I can remember being in scientific meetings with people who said, ah, oh, that British group, they must just be wrong. Uh, I won't say who they were, um, but 
you know, it, it of course turned out that they weren't wrong. They were confirmed quickly by other stations in the Antarctic and also by satellite data. And we now understand the chemistry that actually made the chlorofluorocarbons even more damaging than we thought they would be, um, much, much better than we did before. Could you explain a little bit of the, the scientific uh, mystery and uh, the, the scientific inquiry that Molina and Roland were engaged in, um, the kinds of hypotheses that, that they had and, um, you know, the, the steps from going from, okay, there are lots of CFCs in the lower atmosphere to uh, eventually understanding the uh, chemical pathways um, in their role in ozone depletion. The big issue that they had to deal with was how do these, cl these compounds get destroyed and what is their atmospheric lifetime? And they actually went into the laboratory themselves to uh, try to make measurements relating to that. Uh, so they were um, able to show, uh, I think, through the measurements they made, that the CFCs didn't react with, um, uh, they didn't rain out, that they weren't water soluble. So that was not an issue. Um, that they didn't react with sand. There was some idea that somebody had suggested that they would be destroyed on the sands of the Sahara, and that turned out, of course, not to be true. And, uh, but the, and then they looked at the uh, way in which they would break down. What would happen to them then? I mean, if they have no way to break down in the lower atmosphere, the only place for them to go is up, 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 up. And as you go up, you reach much more energetic sunlight the higher you go. I mean, obviously, if you're in the limits of space, you're getting the direct light from the full spectrum of what the sun can put out. But if you're down on the ground, you got a lot of atmospheric attenuation. So uh, they began to realize that uh, once these molecules got into the stratosphere, that they would eventually break down, make chlorine atoms. And it was known already that those chlorine atoms could go on to react with ozone and, uh, and then there's a, another process, which I'm not going to go into, uh, that actually leads a, to a catalytic cycle that destroys ozone pretty effectively. And that process was already known from other work. Could you actually say a word or two about that? Because I actually think it's interesting, um, the, yeah, the, yeah, how uh, a single chlorine atom can destroy so much ozone. Sure. Um, the uh, chlorine atom reacts with ozone. That makes chlorine monoxide plus O2. Now, if that was all there was, it would be a one-way process. You could never deplete more ozone than the chlorine that you put in. But what happens is that the chlorine monoxide can react with atomic oxygen, for example. So there's, if you go up into the, well, in the lower atmosphere, most of the oxygen, as we know, is in the form of O2, right? So it's the oxygen that we breathe is O2. That's actually true as far as total oxygen pretty much all the way up. But as you get up into the stratosphere, oxygen actually also encounters that high energy ultraviolet light, which breaks it down and makes atomic oxygen. And ozone can also be broken down by high energy light, and that makes atomic oxygen. Ozone is O3. So basically, what first happens is the O2 breaks down with ultraviolet light, making atomic oxygen. The atomic oxygen reacts with another O2 to make ozone. But then the ozone, let's say, photolyzes to make O. So now, if the O comes along and reacts with the ClO, making chlorine atoms again, plus O2, You've liberated the chlorine atom. It can go right back around and do it over and over and over and over. And the reason that's actually happening in the stratosphere, it's in the sunlit atmosphere, ozone and atomic oxygen are uh, exchanging with each other really quickly. So there's always some of both present anytime the sun is lit. So, I mean, at night, the O goes away. But during the day, there's ozone f breaks up with sunlight enough to make some O. So you can just drive this catalytic cycle over and over again, and you can destroy hundreds of thousands of uh, ozone molecules with one chlorine molecule, um, chlorine atom, from a CFC molecule. 
um, in the time scale that the stuff is in the stratosphere. Right, and so I think the the little bit of information about that is that the is the chloro uh, in the chlorofluorocarbon meaning that means chlorine, right? So there's these chlorine atoms that are getting chopped off of them, and then once they're free in the atmosphere, they can uh, be used to basically slice many ozone molecules. And the ozone molecules are heavier and more dense, and so reflect more UV light. No, 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 no. Density has and heaviness has nothing to do with it. Uh, the ozone molecule is just capable of absorbing certain wavelengths of ultraviolet light that no other molecule can in our atmosphere to any appreciable extent. That's why it's so important to life on the planet's surface. It's just a really good light absorber at certain wavelengths. Okay. And so... Um... At this point, um, for Mario Molina and, sorry, it's Sherry Rowland? Yes. And so, so for both of them, this is still um, uh, theoretical or like model-based work, right? It hasn't, there hasn't been any empirical verification of this. That's right. So could you explain then how we move from these uh, lab-based models to actual empirical evidence of you know, these reactions happening, uh, and I guess starting with where Robert Watson fits in? Bob Watson was a chemical kineticist originally and actually had measured some of the reactions that we've just been talking about in the laboratory. So what people do is they go in the lab, I should have said this earlier, they go in the lab and they uh, evaluate how fast individual chemical processes can happen. It's really very elegant work in flow tubes and lasers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's uh, uh, um, something that uh, Watson was, was known for, but he got an opportunity to become uh, a, a uh, leader of a research program in, at NASA, which he took up, and uh, he became very much a leader in the community as far as both organizing missions, field missions, to go out there and look at things uh, in real time, and more importantly, perhaps, a huge leader in the assessment process, which brought the scientists and the policymakers together. I think that uh, you can uh, really look at Bob as a, as a tremendous founder of uh, the, the whole way that we do scientific assessment, together with a gentleman named uh, Bert Bolin, who, uh, who has passed away, unfortunately. After Watson, um, uh, could you then bring in um, how uh, Joe, uh, Joe, Far Joe Farman fits in? Yeah, Joe Farman led the British group that uh, discovered the ozone hole, as I mentioned earlier. So they uh, noticed that their ozone over their station at Halley, Antarctica, um, it just seemed to be decreasing at an alarming rate. And they checked it with another station that they have, which is at a slightly higher latitude, not quite as far to the pole. So I want to say, I should have said, I guess, lower latitude. <laughs> anyway, 65 south is where the other station is. I think Halley is about 73 south, um, might be 78. And uh, they um, uh, found that there was uh, ozone being lost at the other station too, just not as much. And uh, that's when they decided that they just had to publish. So they did, and uh, it attracted my attention along with the attention of a lot of people. I started working on what chemistry could possibly cause this, and what I came up with was that, hey, maybe, and we knew that there was no ozone hole over the Arctic. We knew it was only over the Antarctic, um, you know, because we had measurements from places like Sweden and Norway and, um, you know, if anything, and Canada. If anything was happening, it was nothing like the Antarctic. Uh, so measurements in other places showed ups and downs, you know, variability from year to year, but they weren't showing any kind of trend at that point. They later did, and we can talk about that, but we're talking 1985 here, so really early. Um, I was a young scientist. I was 29 at the time, and I decided that I was going to try to take my photochemical model and uh, 
beat on it and pound on it and make it stand on its head until it produced an ozone hole. <laughs> and uh, so I did that, and I figured out that the reason that it was happening was because Antarctica really is the coldest place on Earth, and it's so cold that clouds form in the Antarctic stratosphere. The stratosphere is very dry, so normally there, there just aren't any clouds. But uh, down in the Antarctic, because it's so cold, the um, vapors mainly water vapor, but also actually nitric acid and other things can condense and uh, form these incredible polar stratospheric clouds. And the clouds completely change the chemistry. We can talk about that, but I think I've maybe gone on too long with my enthusiasm, for which I apologize. No, no, no. This is, a, this is such an important and interesting part of the story. So um, the reason why the ozone hole is, uh, you, you essentially discovered why the ozone hole is where it is. Let me just say one thing before we go back to the ozone hole. One of the interesting things that happened was, of course, Barman and his research group declared that there was a serious depletion happening in Antarctica. So all the scientists that had been building the case with Sherry Rowland and with uh, Mario Molina, instantly jumped on it in the press. And in fact, it was Sherry Rowland that coined the phrase ozone hole. He was the first person to utter that phrase. And that was also a very good case that the public could grasp that. They could look at the NASA graphics, they could talk to scientists. And so there was really a, a great expectation that someday there would be the smoking gun like this, an Antarctic ozone hole or other evidence, and people were ready uh, and prepared to go to the press and go to the public. And in fact, the politicians by this time had been briefed a lot. And at the United Nations, they'd been working on this since uh, 1970, when they organized a working group on stratospheric ozone depletion. So this great scientist and great science was welcomed into the community and they took full advantage of this. And then other great scientists like Susan jumped on it to say, well, how can we go beyond the simple finding uh, of the ozone depletion and track it back to its origin, the CFCs and the other ozone depleting substances? So it was science and politics uh, at its best. Yeah, I guess I, I also want to say that I didn't uh, assume that the ozone hole was necessarily due to chlorofluorocarbons. I tried to produce it all kind of ways with uh, reactive nitrogen from uh, the aurora, with dynamical changes. I just couldn't get it to happen any other way. And what we knew already, and again, I think uh, um, it's, uh, it's a real achievement, was that people had been uh, interested in the idea of reactions on surfaces for a while, um, but mainly because they thought they were perhaps interfering with the measurements they were trying to make in those flow tubes. So the flow tube is basically just a glass tube, and people assumed that there was no surface chemistry that could happen in the stratosphere. We know there is chemistry on surfaces in the lower atmosphere, in the troposphere, and it can be really important. Acid rain is a great example. Surfaces can make chemistry do things that just doesn't happen in the gas phase. That's why you have a catalytic converter in your car. It's a surface that converts the pollutants into something else before it gets out the, the, the tailpipe. So surfaces lead to chemistry happening very differently from gas phase. And we assumed the stratosphere was just gas phase. There couldn't possibly be any surfaces. Um, but interestingly, we, we sort of knew that there were these polar stratosphere clouds. They've been observed by explorers going back, you know, I think 200 years in the Arctic and 120 or so in the Antarctic. So we knew they were there. Uh, we just didn't really carefully evaluate their chemistry. But when people started doing these experiments in the laboratory, they thought certain processes were actually going in the gas phase. So they saw, for example, certain kinds of chlorine molecules going away in their flow tubes, and they thought they had discovered some new gas phase chemistry. Turned out to be something happening on the surface. And they said, oh, okay doesn't matter, it's just on the surface. Well, it turned out to be not just on the surface of the flow tube, but also on the surface of those polar stratospheric clouds. And that's actually the connection that I made. 
I thought, hey, you know, if this is happening in the lab, there's no necessarily reason that it couldn't also happen on polar stratospheric clouds. Now, that was a, a leap that perhaps I shouldn't have taken, but, uh, but anyway, I did. <laughs> it's good that you did. Uh, yeah, could you explain that, that, that what that moment was like more, more so? I mean, that was basically a key, super important scientific discovery. Yeah, I, I had a very hard time believing it when I, when I, you know, this was back in the days when, uh, when I was, so I was running a computer model. This was in the days that uh, you would wait a long time for your output because things were very, very slow. Um, I don't remember, I don't think it was still in the card, you know, computer punch card day. I think I actually did have a file that I submitted. Um, but the, uh, the wait for getting it back, I think, feel, felt interminable. And when I did uh, get the results back, I was just shocked to see how ozone behaved. And one of the key things about it is that it doesn't happen in the winter. In the dead of winter, when the polar regions are dark, this process won't, won't be very important. Um, you have to have not only cold temperatures so the polar stratospheric clouds are there, you also need sunlight to drive certain parts of the chemistry. And I could go into the details of that, but I'm not sure you, you, you need me to do that. It's a, it's a process then that occurs in the Antarctic spring as it comes out of its long period of dark, cold winter, it's still cold, but the sun starts coming back, and that's the combination that then drives the ozone depletion. And that, that began to start happening in my model. So I was pretty shocked. It wasn't quite for the right reason, I have to admit. The process that I had driving that, that final step of what I did identify correctly was that the key reaction is the hydrochloric acid and chlorine nitrate from the chlorofluorocarbons react together on the surface of the polar stratospheric clouds. They do not react in the gas phase. <laughs> we, we thought maybe they did it one time, but then we figured out it was just on the surface of the flow tube, so we forgot about it, everybody, <laughs> except until I remembered. And... Uh, and then uh, um, the hydrochloric acid and chlorine nitrate react on the surface of those clouds. That makes molecular chlorine, Cl2, which photolyzes, breaks apart very readily with sunlight. And that makes chlorine atoms, and now you're off and running to produce ozone depletion. So that part I, I had all correct. What I thought was that the uh, chlorine monoxide might react with HO2 to close the catalytic cycle. Because uh, you don't have much atomic oxygen in the lower stratosphere where the ozone hole was happening. You need to close that catalytic cycle we were talking about earlier with something else. It turned out that really the key thing is CLO reacting with itself to make something called a CLO dimer, which then photolyzes. Um, but we didn't actually know that chemistry yet. We learned about it not too long after. That was discovered in 87. I see. So, um, so essentially, there are these these uh, glass tubes in labs uh, where uh, you know the scientists at the time were trying to um, basically create atmospheric conditions in order to experimentally test uh, the models that they were generating for what happens to ozone up in the atmosphere. And because it's a glass tube, there are you know surface. There's, there's a lot of surface on it. And so they were d discounting, uh, you know, what they were observing in that glass tube because they were saying, you know, the, the upper atmosphere doesn't have any surfaces. So any surface-related reactions don't really make any sense. Right. That's basically it. So, you know, you were looking at that and you just, you, what was it like, uh, what made you think that maybe there were surfaces in the sky? Well, I mean, we knew that polar stratospheric clouds could happen in, in, the, in the Antarctic and also in the Arctic. That, that, that was, like I said, people have visually, you can see them. I've seen them myself. They're, they're, they're clouds. They're actually very beautiful. They're, they look like they're, they're almost a rainbowy kind of appearance because the particles are uh, 
almost all one size, and that creates a, uh, a particular kind of beauty when the sun hits it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see them. They've been seen, literally. Um, there were also satellite data, and uh, that had been published a couple years earlier. That helped to inspire me to think about it, but I, I actually knew about the uh, explorers. Um, I was just intrigued by that kind of stuff. Um, so then um, I was very excited to work with Bob Watson when we formulated a mission to go to the Antarctic and to actually go down there and make measurements that might help to determine whether reactions like that were, hap were indeed happening. And that happened in 1986. Right, so you you're creating these these models that include the surface reaction, and so you've got this uh, 1980s computer that uh, you're submitting this file to, um, and you know what do you get back from that model, and how does that motivate your expedition uh, to go then get measurements? Uh, I, if I remember, I had it programmed to make plots of the percent change in ozone. Um, and there was this, I didn't call it a hole at the time, but there was this, uh, this area over the Antarctic where once I put those reactions in, I got a lot less ozone. I, f I recall something like 30% less. It's published in my paper that I published on this in 1986. So I wrote it up and submitted it to Nature, and uh, it uh, was published in 86, and that was the same year that a lot of us began thinking about how to get down there and test the different ideas that have been put out, because uh, the idea of... Um, chemistry uh, involving chlorofluorocarbons was not the only idea out there. Um, you know, other people had meteorological theories and, um, you know, as I mentioned, there was uh, this possibility that it might be solar activity, I guess somebody thought about. So, you know, there, scientists are always stimulated to come up with ideas um, and we needed to get down there and make the measurements that could discriminate between the different ideas. So. I was uh, very, very fortunate to be young and able to get on an airplane and go to the Antarctic. So I did in 1986. It was great. Most incredible scientific experience in my life, actually. What, what made it so incredible and, and what is it that you, you, you saw? What was, you know, your favorite parts about your expedition to the Antarctic? Well, just going to the Antarctic is an unbelievable experience. I mean, you know, even if you just go on a cruise ship, it's, uh, it's, it's like another planet, you know. It is crystalline, beautiful, unpolluted, uh, pr uh, full of uh, optical effects that are, are just amazing. Uh, and, of course, brutally, brutally cold. Uh, we went down in uh, August of 1986, when I got off the plane, the temperature was about minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So I like to joke that if you're ever on Jeopardy and the final Jeopardy question is at what temperature are Celsius and Fahrenheit the same, the answer is minus 40. Um, but it was, uh, it was, you know, it, 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 I, I have been, I'm originally from Chicago. I've been in cold weather. Um, but I've never been in anything colder than I think about minus 15 before. And uh, it was, uh, it's a shocker. But after a while, after a couple of weeks, minus uh, 15 actually feels very warm. You really do. It's amazing how you acclimatize. Um, everybody laughs. Stephen's laughing as I'm saying this, but it's true. It's true, really. I, I thought I would just kind of curl up in my room the whole time, but I, I didn't. I, I found that it was easy to acclimatize. The t-shirt um, weather. Yeah, really. Well, actually, people do. People actually even go jogging at uh, with, with shorts 15. on at, at minus 15. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, depends on if it's sunny or not. It, the atmosphere is very dry also down in the Antarctic. Um, basically, the cold has wrung all the vapor out of the air. <laughs> did, did you go jogging so, in, your, in your shorts and no, t-shirt at minus 15? No, no, I didn't do that. But I certainly remember feeling warm at minus 15 and, you know, like opening up my jacket and stuff like that. And I definitely kept my window open if it was minus 15. So, um, yeah, I did, I did. Um, but 
Um, I made some measurements with my colleagues uh, using um, visible spectroscopy. So we used the sun or the moon or the sky as a light source, and we measured uh, chlorine dioxide, which is a closely related molecule to chlorine monoxide, and we were able to show, particularly with the moonlight measurements, that the values we found were, you know, a hundred times more than they should have been. We, we couldn't measure them anywhere else because they were below our detection limit, but they were actually quite measurable in the Antarctic. So that was the key measurement that, that we made, and it was an incredible night, the night that we actually did that, and then I think it was the next day that I made the uh, data analysis, and there it was. It was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing moment. Could you explain more about how that, that, that particular data that you measured fit into the analysis and, and what it proved and, you know, the feelings and experience of what it was like to finally have an answer? First of all, there's the getting of the data, which involves uh, putting mirrors up on the roof of a little building in the Antarctic and uh, directing the moonlight right down into the instrument and uh, doing that when it's cold and windy can be a bit of a challenge. So setting it up for measurement is uh, physically challenging. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, taking the data, um, analyzing the data. Uh, I, I was, uh, I think, careful enough to realize that that wasn't going to be the only thing it would take to convince everyone that chlorine was the cause of the ozone hole. Uh, the chlorine had to have come, the chlorine dioxide that we measured had to have come from the chlorofluorocarbons. There was no other e even conceivable source for it. And it was a hundred times more of it than there should have been. And that's because it had gotten the, the, the reactive species and chlorine dioxide is a, is a reactive form of chlorine had gotten liberated from unreactive forms of chlorine, like hydrochloric acid and chlorine nitrate, which reacted on the surfaces of those clouds, and they don't do that anywhere else. So that's a little more detail than I thought you might have wanted, but, but that's why. You take these, what we call reservoir species for chlorine, hydrochloric acid and chlorine nitrate, and you convert them to active chlorine, and now you're really off and running for ozone depletion, and that's what happens on those clouds. You're getting this 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 data about these particular chemical molecules, and then so you the, the you know t tell me a little bit more about the the actual analysis and you know what it's like being in the Antarctic, feeling like you've you know you've discovered why there is a potentially world-ending hole. Well, I will tell you this: I I was really careful. I think maybe Stephen can correct me if he thinks I'm wrong, but. I was pretty careful about not broadcasting the news before we were really, really sure. So the moon measurements alone were not enough to convince me. Uh, and one of the things that actually excited me a lot was when we realized we could also see this in the uh, scattered sunlight that we got. If the sun was low enough on the horizon, there was even enough chlorine dioxide to measure it then. So what it is is a visible spectrograph. It's got a diode array in it, like actually very similar to the diode array that reads the um, prices when you go to the supermarket today. Back in the 80s, those were incredibly expensive because they had just been invented. Um, and we had one that was cooled to very cold temperatures to keep it from having too much noise in it. And we, direct, we had a spectrograph, which you can think of as being sort of like uh, a prism that you shine sunlight through and you separate out the wavelengths of light or the colors of light come out as a, you know, as a little rainbow that you see when you, when you put a, a crystal in front of a, a, a source of light. And so that's essentially what we're doing. We're putting a, uh, a grating, in this case a diffraction grating, uh, in the beam of the moonlight, and we're collecting the separated wavelengths of light on our detector, and we're looking for the absorption of atmospheric chemicals. And we can measure ozone that way, we can measure nitrogen dioxide at a different wavelength, but chlorine dioxide has a particular band structure in the visible that is what we measured. And we can also see it, the fact that we could also see it in the skylight 
and that the difference between the skylight and the moonlight was consistent with what we expected from chemistry and consistent with what you would need to deplete the ozone layer it got me pretty excited. Um, there was another group on our expedition that measured chlorine monoxide using a different method, a microwave emission technique, which is the same one that's used nowadays by satellite, uh, but in those days it was only used from the ground. Um, so, and they also measured high levels of chlorine monoxide. And last but not least, I'll say that uh, the, the following year in 1987, uh, Watson organized another mission, which actually flew on airplanes from uh, Chile down to Antarctica and measured chlorine monoxide yet a th another way by um, uh, a laser resonance fluorescence on board an airplane that actually literally flew right into the ozone hole. So I would say, fair to say that from the science community point of view, when all those measurements were in, people got pretty convinced. But they also had to be written up. I mean, it had to be peer reviewed before something that important could really be talked about as, uh, as a known piece of science. So I, I was very cautious about um, spreading the word too early. So if you look at the history of the Montreal Protocol, uh, what you see is that in 1985, there was something called the Vienna Convention that was passed by the United Nations. It had about uh, two dozen members signed it. And this is what's called a framework convention that makes it possible to have something like the Montreal Protocol. So that was in the spring of 1985, and shortly thereafter, Farman published his article, which was a tremendous reinforcement to the policy members that had anticipated that soon there would be evidence and that they needed to be prepared. And then as we went into 1986, and Susan is doing uh, with her colleagues this brilliant work in Antarctica, the preparations underway for the Montreal Protocol. And the scientists were telling the Montreal Protocol that it could be another explanation for the ozone hole, so that you should hold your fire until you're sure of the results. And you can find that in uh, lots of the accounts at the time. But by uh, the time of the meeting, September of 1987, there was still a lot of uncertainty. But the policy makers were able to talk to their national scientists and others and felt confident enough to go ahead and, and uh, confirm the Montreal Protocol. So I would view it from my point of view and perspective that it was a continuous improvement in the science and the threshold of belief occurred for different people at different times. Uh, but uh, you could then say, of course, there were still skeptics in 1987, but it was my experience that they were mostly gone by 1990. And so the work I was doing, mostly with corporations, there was uh, rarely a meeting where there would be science skeptics after 1990, that they were gone from the earth, as moved on to climate, in fact. So, so it was a tremendous contribution of science. And the other thing that's important to realize is the industry that used these chemicals uh, was not devoted to them. They'd been reassured by DuPont and others that they were completely safe and that there was no reason to worry. And then as soon as the Antarctosano came along, they panicked and they rushed to the market to find alternatives. And that's one of the reason the Montreal Protocol happened so fast is the industry, in some ways, was faster to grasp the science than even the policymakers. Stephen, I'd love to bring you in. Uh, I'd love to bring you in here uh, to to describe the, um, in particular, you know, the transition from uh, the discovery the that Suvazin was involved in. Um, to the to the Montreal Protocol. So, you know, wh what are the steps between the discovery and the Montreal Protocol? Um, and how do we eventually get to um, the technology and economic assessment panel uh, that you co-founded? I'm glad to describe that. Uh, it's exactly what, what Susan said, is that there's a laborious process to prove the science, and then there's another process to communicate it. And that's partly what Susan did and Bob Watson and another scientist, uh, uh, Dan Albritton. And they were masters of communication. And there were lots of meetings held 
between the scientists and the diplomats, but also the scientists and the companies, including uh, the National Academy of Engineering did its own review of the science on behalf of industry and came up with a confirmation report, I would call it. No new science, a narrow view of science, but nonetheless, it was the message coming from the people they most respected. And Sherry Rowland was involved in that and many, many others. So the communication was very quick. And in fact, I would say by January of 1988, you could see big changes. So the protocols signed in September 87. In January of 88, there's a large conference. And at that conference, there were several important announcements. The most spectacular was that AT&T announced that they had found a, a nature-based solvent made from the terpenes from oranges and lemons and pine trays that could clean half of the electronics equally or better than the CFC 113 it replaced. And they say that they said that transition was technically possible within one year. So they went from skepticism and standing back to becoming the driving force. And it was also important because this terpene was not another synthetic chemical. It was naturally derived and harvested from the disposal of the orange rinds and the lemon rinds and then put to positive purpose. So this was an eye-opener to a lot of people that thought you had to have an elaborate chemical to have an elegant solution. And then at that same meeting, the auto industry stepped forward and realized that most of the emissions from car air conditioning was from servicing and from leakage. And so for the first time, they got together a partnership that developed commercial recycling for air conditioning. They did that within one year. And the next year after they confirmed and approved the technology, they sold a billion dollars worth of recycling equipment all across the world. So there's this enthusiasm of going from panic that there would be high costs and disruption to the enthusiasm of profits and saving money. So it was uh, the science that drove this, but it was the technical innovation that did this. And then very shortly thereafter, and in an overlapping way, there were similar breakthroughs in foam. There was a commitment by the American Food Packaging Institute uh, to halt the use of CFCs in foam within one year and to switch away from all fluorinated gases as quickly as possible. So we see this building momentum and enthusiasm. You have international companies that are pledging to get out. And all the while, uh, we haven't reached the Montreal Protocol entering into force because that occurs later after the signing. And when it was signed, and the, the first big assessment, which Susan was involved in as well, uh, was done in 1989. Uh, and so this was an assessment that you alluded to. It included the scientific assessment panel. It inclu included the uh, environmental effects assessment panel. And then it included the work on technology and economics. And this was the idea of how do you make the best available information uh, readily uh, absorbed by policymakers and business community. But Steve, I would just add one thing that you already said, and that is it all starts with people understanding the problem. Um, you know, you talked about the fact that people everywhere, the public and all around the world, could look at these uh, satellite images of the ozone hole and say, hey, you know, that's actually pretty scary stuff. Um, and that created the will, the political will, that generated the demand for all the products that you've just described. I think without people understanding the whole thing, nothing happens personally. You're absolutely right. And in fact, in the case of that food packaging, it was a school teacher in, Manu in Massachusetts and her children in the class that wrote to McDonald's Corporation and said, why are you destroying the ozone layer? So the people at McDonald's, commissioned a survey of their customers, including children, and the customers responded they did not want to destroy the ozone layer, and it made a big difference to where they chose to eat. And in the case of McDonald's, children drive parents to the restaurant. The parents say, 
where do you want to go today? And they say McDonald's. So it was a huge impact. It was an eyes open uh, business decision. And they uh, had announced prior to the, the Packaging Institute changing that they were going to stop the purchase. Yeah, they were putting hamburgers in foam uh, clamshells and they switched over to cardboard, which is fine because McDonald's is so delicious. You eat it so fast anyway, you don't need the foam. <laughs> That's right. Hot side, hot, cold side, cold was the slogan. But this is this is exactly right. What Susan's saying is you have this circular effect where you have the customers pushing the companies, you have the companies pushing their suppliers, and you have the policymakers setting deadlines. And pretty soon you've got this wheel turning very fast. And as quickly as you catch up with the available technology, then you look to the next strengthening of the Montreal Protocol. And that's what we saw over the decades of the Montreal Protocol. More and more chemicals control, faster and faster phase out. Stephen, could you explain uh, more specifically what the Montreal Protocol was and, and, and you know, who the key stakeholders were and how it came together and then was signed and ratified and, and what that meant? So my role, I was very fortunate because I was hired by the EPA in 1986 in preparation for the negotiations of the Montreal Protocol. And uh, I'm an economist by training, and so I had the highest interest in showing that this was going to be cost-effective and feasible and that the technology uh, would come together. The mastermind behind the Montreal Protocol was the head of the United Nations Environment Pro Pro Program, Dr. Mustafa Tolba, who was a botanist himself and an accomplished author and I think was very quick at grasping this science. So you have the force of the United Nations organizing the meetings, and then you have the science that's providing the justification for the treaty, and then you have leadership countries that were advocates of a treaty. And that included a group that was called the Toronto Group because it was partly stationed in Toronto, but that was the United States, Canada, Norway, Denmark, uh, many other countries, uh, Sweden, uh, that got together as a group and helped craft the language that they could sell to other countries. And so it was a masterfully designed document in retrospect. And included in that document was the idea of start and strengthen. So if you look at it, it only was two chemicals, CFC, and then a fire extinguishing agent called Halon. And in the first negotiation in 1987, it was just to freeze the production of Halon, stop it from growing, and cut back CF CFCs 50%. But that was not hard to do because 30% was still aerosol and convenience cosmetic products. So it was a very conservative start. But the science was so persuasive in the years ahead that they said to the, to the policy makers at the Montreal Protocol, that's not enough. You will not protect the ozone layer with those two chemicals, and you certainly won't with those modest reductions. So then they added more CFCs. They added uh, carbon tetrachloride, methyl chloroform, methyl bromide. A, a litany of chemicals were added. And then each time that they would meet, every two or three years, they would have an acceleration of the phase out. So it was a very practical approach. Uh, that was done on an international basis. And one of the beauties of this treaty is it includes incredibly strong trade restrictions so that if a country did not join the Montreal Protocol, they would lose access to these ozone-depleting substances even before the phase-out. So it had lots of clever features and lots of uh, brilliant leadership. And what Susan said about people mattering, it, it, they mattered a lot over and over again. And there were two or 300 people that had a chance to become ozone champions and make a real difference to the world. Could you, could you explain who the who were the main stakeholders involved in the Montreal Protocol? So was this mostly, uh, you know, d developed nations leading it or? That is a great question. That's a fantastic question and it explains a lot of why it was such a challenge. 
So if you look at the full set of chemicals that are controlled by the Montreal Protocol, they were divided into 240 separate sectors. So distinguishable industry groups that had their own interests uh, in uh, keeping these chemicals or to phase them out. So if you look at those, at some of the ones that Susan meant, mentioned, the air conditioning and refrigeration, and that includes industrial refrigeration because many chem chemical processes require that, and commercial refrigeration and also what's called cold chain, the processing and the freezing and refrigerating of food in order for it to reach market. So that alone would have been daunting. But in addition to that, there were these chemicals used as solvents in aerospace, in electronics, in the manufacture of medical devices. It was used as a sterilant and as I mentioned as an aerosol for meter dose inhalers. It was used in firefighting, including in closed areas like on airplanes and submarines and ferries and ships and places that you can't evacuate in the, in if there's a fire, where you have to stay on board the burning vehicle. So it was uh, included uh, all of the NASA satellites and the, and the space labs and the, and the uh, rocket equipment, manufacture of solid rocket motor for the space shuttle required methyl chloroform. So you have these, and then there were laboratory uses. So it's used as a tracer gas, as, as Susan mentioned, but also it was used to have a dense gas for a wind tunnel. And it was used for a pressure check testing of scientific instruments to make sure there were no leakages of gases in or out. So as it got going also, it was discovered that every weapon system in every military organization dependent on ozone depleting substances. All the command centers were protected with HALON, all the ships, tanks, submarines protected by HALON, all the electronics and aerospace manufactured and serviced with CFC and methyl chloroform, all the gyroscope manufacturing for the weapons guidance, whole list all the way down, uh, all the optical readers, all the AWACS, Everything that they could look at had some use. And so it required these stakeholders to look fundamentally at the basis of what they were doing and decide how do you shift from using this chemical to a performance standard that would allow industry to compete as how they could produce an alternative that would be a pure replacement. And uh, one measure that I think your, your listeners will find interesting is that if you ask the public today, or even the affected industries, no one has stories of train wrecks, or disappointment, or failed systems, because it was such so successful, most consumers would have their entire house changed, and they would not notice this. The glues that are used to assemble furniture were ozone-depleting substances, uh, but people have not stopped buying furniture. Uh, and so if, if you went back, it's the smallest list of uses that found no substitutes. So it's quite remarkable. Stephen, so I, I'd love it if you could, uh, you know, you know, you were on uh, this panel, um, I believe the, the chair of it for, for many years. Um, so I, I'm curious if you could explain more so, uh, you know, what that experience was like. What is it that you necessarily did on the technology and economic assessment panel and what the impact of that was for, um, you know, implementing the solution that was needed after uh, Susan helped to discover the mechanism of the problem. Yeah, you know, thank you for asking me that because that's what I'm most proud of, of course. Uh, when I was appointed with uh, Vic Buxton from Canada to set up the first technical panel, uh, we were like-minded and we had a great idea. And that was instead of casting out for experts from various sources and seeking wide participation and a balance of interest, we didn't do that at all. We recruited the experts from the organizations that were already committed to protect the ozone layer because these would be people motivated to find a solution rather than intellectually interested 
in, in describing solutions, or even worse, be a stakeholder against a new alternative, and they would become internal critics. So the notion was that you, on a technical committee, you could not have a better set of people than the people whose success in their enterprise depends on finding alternatives and realize that a team could find the alternatives faster than others. The other secret of our success is we had something called self-affecting technical solutions. And so, for example, one of the chairs of the, of the HALON committee studying HALON was the chair of the National Fire Protection Association that set the standards for where HALON is used. So as quickly as a use could be eliminated with an alternative, he would go back to his committee and decertify HALON on that use. We had members of the Coast Guard on the committee, and as quickly as there were alternatives on ships, they removed from the requirements of the United Nations uh, Maritime Organization the use of HALON. So it went from compelling the use for safety to prohibiting the use for environment. So it was this remarkable internal group. And if you go back also, you'll notice that some of the most important technologies were invented by people that only met on the committee for the first time. So you had groups of, of uh, military suppliers that got together and uh, telecommunication suppliers and invented something called no clean soldering that eliminated the use of solvents and saved the ozone layer, but it also increased the reliability of the products. And they were in, uh, enthusiastic about commercialization to the extent that they patented the technology and then donated it to the public domain. So it could be used anywhere in the world uh, at no expense to the user. So it, you have this enthusiastic group of, of genius engineers working on a short deadline and constantly resupplied with motivation from scientists like Susan, because as fast as they would take satisfaction in what they'd accomplished, they were being told it's not enough. It's not enough to just do these chemicals. We have to do more. It's not enough to do these chemicals on the old schedule. We have to go faster. So some of these sectors halted their uses uh, years ahead of the deadlines of the Montreal Protocol or the Clean Air Act. It was. Uh, really quite inspirational, and, and most of those people would tell you it was the best part of their life because they never would have been allowed to work with the engineers from the competing corporations if it hadn't been for the team drawing those together for public purpose. So is a, is a good way to characterize this then that there's this huge set of... Uh... Of, of, of compounds that when they get up in the upper atmosphere, they release chlorine. And, um, the, you know, the chlorine is really the, the big issue. And so, um, you know, these hydrochlorocarbons are being used in so many applications. Um, you've described a lot of them. And so the, the job of this committee is to, one, uh, you know, uh, slowly through regulation phase out um, – you know, this long list of uh, ozone-depleting chemicals while also generating uh, alternatives to their use that are not ozone-depleting. Yeah, that's right, generating or identifying. And there's a, a subtle uh, problem we face that's now being faced again for climate. And that is, as Susan mentioned, most of these chemicals have long atmospheric lifetimes. So when you stop producing a CFC, it can be a slow decline in the chlor chlorine that's been contributed to the stratosphere over many, many years. Others of the chemicals like methyl chloroform and most of the HCFCs have short lives. And so any reductions you make in these chemicals that do all their damage within a short number of years has a bigger effect immediately than doing the same amount of effort on one of these other chemicals. And what the scientists were telling the Technical Options Committee and the Montreal Protocol was that we had to worry about the long run and the short run. And so HCFCs as refrigerants and foam blowing agents were viewed as a transitional substance. So if you stopped using CFC 11, 
and you started using HCFC 22, that was an improvement in both the GWP and the forcing of, of uh, ozone depletion. And the same thing for methyl chloroform. So the ambition in, of the Montreal Protocol was to work incredibly quickly to get rid of the short-term chemicals and uses within alternatives, that would be solvents, uh, for example, using methyl chloroform, but at the same time allow some HCFCs so that you didn't have to endure the continued use of the CFCs. And that was that was the technical challenge, to keep your eye on the long run and at the same time keep your eye on the short run. And some of the scientists uh, were all also over-motivating that kind of ambition because there was a concern that we might go too far in sending chlorine and bromine to the stratosphere and do irreparable damage or damage that would take much longer to solve. So true or not, it was highly motivational and it caused a tremendous effort on our committees, uh, first of all, to get rid of methyl chloroform. If you look at the curve of methyl chloroform and the overall ozone uh, protection, it was a, a critical first step and it was accomplished probably in two and a half years worldwide. So let me uh, toot Stephen's horn a little bit and then also uh, clarify one, one point. I mean, I think the, the invention of the Technology and Economic Assessment Panel, TEEP as we call it, of the Montreal Protocol was a real masterstroke because it brought the uh, engineers and scientists from industry into the process to help figure out what could be done and so the way the assessment process worked is on a systematic basis, the science group that I was part of would assess the science. Steve's group would assess, okay, the science says we got to phase these things out. What can we phase out? What, what is technically feasible? And we would provide these reports uh, along with the one from the impacts panel that would say, you know, if you keep doing this, you're going to have so many skin cancer cases a year by 2050 and stuff like that. All three of those reports would be explained to a group of policymakers in a UN meeting. So the, uh, the decisions weren't actually made by Steve, but Steve's group was highly, highly influential in uh, educating the policymakers and guiding them, really, um, on what would make the most sense, what could be done the most cost effectively, the most quickly, et cetera, et cetera. And then they made the decisions. But um, the great thing about it is it, it, it's not a political group at all. It's, we, you know, it's a, in the old days we would call them a bunch of guys with slide rules. And you know, that included the people who came from industry. They weren't the political leaders of those companies. They were, they were the people in the trenches trying to actually figure out what to do instead. And, and that's what made it work so well. Uh, I really have often wished that we had uh, a similar way of doing the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, assessment process. We have a science panel that's pretty similar, um, but, but we don't really have quite the same technology panel. And many people have commented that the technology panel that Steve put together was uh, you know, just huge in making the Montreal Protocol work as well as it has. And the ozone layer is actually finally beginning to heal. So it's a real testimony to their success. Yes, Stephen, please, I, I invite you to uh, toot your own horn a little bit more here because your contribution was, you know, extremely significant um, towards the towards the elimination of the the ozone hole. Um, I have a, a fun fact here uh, that I that is from a paper of yours. Um, the, so in 2007, um, Stephen, uh, you released a paper with Velders' uh, team published The Importance of the Montreal Protocol in Protecting Climate. Um, and the team quantified the benefits of the Montreal Protocol and found that it helped present, uh, prevent 11 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year uh, and delay the impacts of climate change by seven to 12 years. So, um, yeah, please, uh, you know, what are some of your favorite achievements? For, and, you know, this is something you're involved in for decades. Yeah, that's a, a great story. And I'm, of course, very glad to tell it. Uh, one of the things people know about me that have worked with me for many years is I work by slogans a lot. 
So I try to reduce my ambition to something that's like a chant or a short uh, instruction that I can give myself to move ahead. And after years of working with Susan and many other scientists and Mario Molina and Sherry Rowland and struggling with these issues year after year after year and waiting for the science to come on board and there'd be a missing link and there'd be something that was misinterpreted and we'd have to go back to square one. I came up with the slogan, science too important to leave to chance. And what that meant was that it was my job to say, what kind of information are the policy members missing? Those are the people I hang out with all the time. Because at the same time I was the deputy director for stratospheric ozone protection at the EPA, I was the liaison to the Department of Defense on climate and ozone layer protection. So I was in those meetings where people were trying to decide, is it worth investing another millions of dollars in this new technology or should we do something else? So uh, in working with Susan in 1995 on a joint report between the IPCC and the TEEP, I realized that the Montreal Protocol had done a lot for climate that wasn't well appreciated over at the Montreal Protocol, that these facts were available. So I put together what we called a dream team, which include uh, Goose Velders, who was the lead author, a brilliant scientist from the Netherlands, it included David Fahey, who was one of colleagues of uh, Susan at NOAA, and John Daniel. And then it included Mac McFarland, who's a scientist who was once at NOAA, but worked the better part of his career at DuPont. And so we had, a, and then myself, who had been on the tape for oh so many years and at EPA. So the idea of the team was to say just how big was the contribution of the Montreal Protocol to protecting the climate, and how do we communicate that to the Montreal Protocol so they would consider that as part of their obligation and part of their legacy? Because we were coming up, my concern, we were coming up to a very long interval of HCFC use, that the Montreal Protocol had plateaued its ambition, and they had accomplished so much, they were resting on their laurels, and they had lost this impulse to get more stringent. So this committee was put together, it quickly uh, put together all the facts, incredibly complicated at the time, although people have done work like this since confirming it. And this dream team came up with the conclusion that the Montreal Protocol had already accomplished more than the Kyoto Protocol could have accomplished if every party, every state government in the world had joined Kyoto and if all of them had met its obligations. So this was huge. I mean, it was shocking to us. It was shocking to the world. We brought it back the same year, 1997, uh, 97, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 2007 to the Montreal Protocol. And that year they accelerated the HCFC phase down. So it was a, a tremendous victory. And it was exactly what I, what I would hope would happen is if we assembled science in a new way that was headline news, that the policymakers would get the message and do something important. And then two years later, the same team decided, well, why don't we show the Montreal Protocol how important it could be if the chemicals that replaced 15% of the ozone depleting chemicals, which are HFCs, were phased down under the Montreal Protocol. Ozone safe chemicals, controlled by the Montreal Protocol. And that was accomplished in 2016, it took a decade. Uh, so, uh, but we're very proud of ourselves. And I think it's a perfect example of the advantage of a group of people with a wide set of skills working together, including somebody like me, who's not an atmospheric scientist, working with atmospheric scientists and making more clear uh, what the policymakers need to know. I love the I love the pivot in here now into you know extracting some of these lessons that you're sharing, Stephen, for um, how we might do better with modern uh, climate issues uh, from greenhouse gases um, and also other uh, global catastrophic risks. 
Um, but you, you know, I, I think that's a, you know, you guys have done an excellent job of telling the story of the, the science and the discovery, and then also the, uh, strategic part and like the, the solution making of, um, the story of the ozone hole. Um, so as we get to the end of that, I'm curious if you have anything else you'd like to wrap up on about that story or, you know, what is a, what is a key insight or what is this whole, when, you know, when you look back at everything that you've, you know, you've contributed and been through, what is it that, that stands out to you? You know, my theory of change, I think, is the same as Susan's, that people matter the most, that the ability to bring the right people together at the right place with the right instructions is bound to have an important conclusion. And one of the things that I always found was if you have the best engineers, no matter what their attitude, if they have the goal that is coincident of the environmental protection, they'll find a solution. So I think this accumulating of the science and the engineers and coordinating the activity, these assessment panels are just everything. That if you do that, you can't help but be successful. But the other thing that I'm realizing now is that you have, when you're in a hurry, like we are for climate, you have to take advantage of the existing institutions. So as quickly as we added HFCs to the Montreal Protocol, I would like to add other chemicals, N2O, nitrous oxide, which is an ozone depleting greenhouse gas that was neglected by the Montreal Protocol. And then there's other gases like methane that have nothing to do with the sectors that are involved in the Montreal Protocol, but the framework of the Montreal Protocol might be perfect for a methane treaty. So you might have the Montreal Protocol people help design a methane treaty, or if the Montreal Protocol can find its way to create new capacity with new skill sets, you could have methane drawn into the Montreal Protocol because its genius is partly that you turn off the chemical at the source and force all the downstream changes to occur. And that's different than something like EPA, where you often find one part of the problem, uh, catalytic converters and gasoline, and you implement that. But you're not focusing on the big picture, which is electrification of the cars. And so there's, there's this um, inherent advantage of the Montreal Protocol, top down, turn off the chemical, bring on the technical information, bring people together for solutions, uh, reinforce and reward. So uh, I could go on for the longest time. I'm very enthusiastic about the success of the Montreal Protocol. I absolutely believe the lessons could be taken up better than they have been. And I think if they were taken up, we'd be well on our way in many other environmental problems. Yeah, I like to uh, tell students in my classes, and I feel like I've learned this over the years with Montreal, and I've seen it in so many other problems as well, that there's three Ps that determine how well we do on any environmental problem. The first one is personal. Is the issue personal to, to, to me, to us? Uh, and with the, in the case of the ozone issue, it was deeply personal because skin cancer, I mean, you know, cancer doesn't get any more personal than cancer. Right, but, but also all the other uh, attendant things that it can do. Um, the second P is perceptible. Is the issue perceptible to me? The best case is if I can see it with my own eyes, you know, like, like smog. Um, but, you know, seeing the satellite images that we talked about earlier, you know, that, that was good enough uh, to, to make it perceptible to a lot of people. And the third big P is, are there practical solutions? And that's where Stephen's type of work has been so important. So when you think about climate change and you think about the three Ps, um, people haven't really considered it personal until pretty recently because it seemed like a future problem, not a today problem. And we can talk all we want to about, you know, caring about our grandchildren, but, you know, really what we care about is, is us, right? So... Um, and we do care about our grandchildren, of course we do, but not as much as we care about us. It's just a fact, I think. Uh, it's no natural and normal, we don't need to be embarrassed about it. Uh, particularly when you're talking about a future problem, and you can always hope that there'll be other solutions in place by then. So is it personal? For a long time we thought it wasn't. Is it perceptible? 
for a long time we didn't feel like it was. Nowadays, I would say more and more people are recognizing it as personal and perceptible. The kinds of things that have happened in the world this year have just been amazing in, in being wake-up calls because so many places have flooded, so many places have had massive fire. These are all the sorts of issues that we knew were happening. So much erosion is going on because of rising sea levels. People are just... And actually, when people would say to me, well, it's not really perceptible yet, my answer to that would be, yeah, I know, and it's a problem, but, you know, it's going to fix itself with time. And I think we're just about there. It has fixed itself. And then there's that big third P, is are the solutions practical? And there's been a lot of propaganda, you know, out there saying they, solutions are not practical, but I think we're reaching the point now where we recognize that they are. So I, I think that we're really at a turning point on climate change. I, I'd love to pivot here more into exploring uh, lessons to extract for, for what we can do about climate change uh, and other global catastrophic risks for you know, the theory of change about what we might do about those. Uh, and I'm also mindful of the, uh, the time here. So if we could hit on these a little bit faster, that would be, be great. Um, one thing I don't, one thing I, I don't think that, or one thing I would like to hit on more clearly is um, what is the bad thing that would have happened if, um, you know, the work of you, Stephen, and the work of you, Susan, um, and all of the others who were involved in the discovery and, uh, you know, solution towards the ozone hole, what is the bad thing that, that would have happened, um, you know, if we had just continued to use CFCs? There's a lot of work on that now. People call it the world avoided scenarios. So what world did we avoid? Well, by mid-century, it would have been a, about a degree hotter than it's actually going to get. So that's a degree Celsius, by the way. So instead of, you know, a degree from uh, a degree and a half from mainly CO2 and methane that we're trying to avoid, we would have an extra degree on top of that from CFCs that we would have had to avoid. That's a big deal. Um, something like 20 million skin cancer cases in the United States sticks in my mind by mid-century, but uh, I would have to look, check that number by, to, to, to be absolutely sure. Yes, Susan's absolutely right. There's a lot of skin cancer cataracts, but one of the things you can look at is you can say two interesting things. You could say, what if Molina and Roland had not had this hypothesis? And certainly you could say, well, someone would eventually. But if it had been five years later or 10 years later, it would have been catastrophic because it did take time, as Susan said. It does take time to make a hypothesis, to confirm it, to do the ground measurements, to do the aerial flights and so forth. So it was just in time or a little bit too late that it was really a tight schedule that was working when you include diplomacy and corporate changes and, and all of those things. But you can also look and say, what if the Montreal Protocol and Molina had been delayed some period of time? And what you can see is exactly what Susan said, that the CFCs would have grown in climate forcing, let alone ozone depletion, to a level that would have been untenable for Earth, that they could have been almost the same level as the CO2 climate forcing. So we were incredibly fortunate to have this early announcement it was incredibly uh, fortunate that the Antarctic ozone hole was noticed uh, finally and announced, and it was such a spectacular persuasion, uh, and then fortunate that the Montreal Protocol was able to take this and then in a derivative that the corporations were able to make the, the reductions. I also think it's important to remember that this really was a training ground for a lot of people, that the scientists had not worked together successfully on assessments this large and so continuously brilliant over so many years. If you look back at each of the assessment panels, I find almost no valid criticism of any of the findings at any of the points in time, that this was uh, a well done process, uh, actually uh, stunning. So uh, the world avoided, uh, if you read the Nobel Award for 1995 for Crutzen and Molina and Roland, it says that life on Earth would not have been possible as we know it. If you read Paul Newman's report on World Avoided, you find out that 
it would have been untenable to go outside at most latitudes for very long without sun protection, far beyond what people wear when they go out today. So it would have been a lot of joy taken away, a lot of uh, misery, uh, misery brought on by uh, these medical effects, and it would be a less successful world because these technologies that replace the ozone depleting substances are purely superior, better energy efficiency, less toxic, more durable, more easy to repair and reliable. It's quite a success story. So let's um let let's explore um uh, you know the these these peas as uh as, as Susan has put it um so we have the issue of of uh, greenhouse gases uh warming the the, the climate today um, and a lot of you know what you were involved in Stephen was the economics of making transitions. So both um, the innovation required to um, replace HFCs and then also the questions around that being economical. Um, so this is, you know, the importance also of uh, industry being involved in the in the process. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious if you could explain, um, you know, your experience with industry and how difficult or easy it was to get industry to make this transition and how that compares to the transition that industry and governments need to make in the modern day around climate change and how much of that difference, you know, is a bit circumstantial around the technologies and innovations that need to be made. Yeah, that's a great question. Susan, I, I think agree and I agree that, that some of the stakeholders on the climate side uh, were more persistently ruthless than we've experienced under the Montreal Protocol. The early days when Melina and Roland came up with their announcement, it could not have been more ruthless. Character assassination, uh, they were lists of uh, people that were not to be hired. Uh, the regents of the University of California prohibited Sherry Roland for applying to certain uh, organizations for funding and on and on. But if you look at what's been done by the coal companies and petroleum companies, I think that that was orders of magnitude worse over a longer period of time, including interjecting a lot of wrong science over and over again, which was a terrible distraction and also took a lot of energy away. So there's no doubt about the differences of the two. But what I have found out working on ozone layer is even sectors that have a bad reputation for other topics can be leaders on a topic uh, once motivated, as Susan Solomon says, and come to believe what they're doing. I'll give an example. Uh, the automotive industry was among the most rigorous in getting rid of their solvent, their foam uses. Uh, foams in cars include what are called safety foams. So that under the dash of the car, originally it was underneath the surface of the fabric, it was all ozone depleting substances. It was all ozone depleting substances for the refrigerant, uh, for the solvent to make the components, for the electronics and so forth. Uh, but they looked at the science, they got motivated, and they stopped using these chemicals as quickly as the other sectors. Uh, so they were one of the one of the fast to go. So what my lesson is, is you shouldn't judge a book by the cover. You should not hold it against an, or an institution because they misbehaved in the past, and you should give them a chance to make a new start on leadership right now. Uh, the other thing I would add is the public right now is much more engaged in climate than they ever were in ozone layer protection. So if you go back, there were very few of the industry projects that had active involvement of non-government organizations, environmentalists, uh, because it was being done so well by the companies themselves that would have been a futile use of those talents. But you look today, there are thousands of organizations uh, that are demanding changes in industry. They're in the streets, they're protesting. Uh, this did not happen for the ozone layer. It was the smallest amount of activity. So there's uh, the difficulty of the fossil fuel industry, but it's offset by the ambition of the non-government organizations 
and some of the government. So uh, lots of things that are happening there. What would you add, Susan? Well, I think you summarized it pretty well. Uh, I think the other thing I would add is the engagement of young people today. Uh, they have been uh, exercised and have become uh, pretty upset about the future that they see themselves inheriting. Uh, Greta Thunberg has done a fantastic job, I think, of uh, mobilizing worldwide, I, in, in a sense, the ability to get together on things like, um, you know, the tools that we now have with the internet have allowed that to become an international movement much more effectively than we could have ever done in the 80s for climate, no matter how concerned we were, you know, the telephone only worked so fast. So, uh, you know, I think you see a public engagement on climate change that is driving a lot of, uh, of what's going on and having a huge influence. Is, is there anything that you, you know, is there anything that you both wish or would suggest as actions or, um, you know, things that are really important for the generation, you know, the generations that face climate change, you know, what it is that um, they need to understand and do? I mean, we're talking about making things uh, practical, personal, and then is the last P perspective? Personal, perceptible, and practical. Yeah, um, and, and so there's still this, I mean, a large problem also beyond um, these issues, global catastrophic and existential risk issues, um, beyond making them personal, um, and there is certainly difficulty around making action around them practical. Um, with the last P for perceptible, a lot of people don't even agree about the science of climate change. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's any similarities between that and what you experience with HFCs and what you suggest there is to do about that. I mean, because the, the climate issue has become politicized, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I, I would argue that it is becoming perceptible. I think most people uh, around the world have noticed that the summers are hotter than they used to be, that heat waves are more extreme than they used to be. So uh, perceptible is not so much the problem anymore, I don't believe. Um, what What is the problem is the practical, that they believe that it would cost too much and that it's not practical to do it. Um, that is increasingly becoming less and less tenable. Um, when it comes to power plants, for example, it is nowadays, if you're going to build a new one, it is cheaper to do it with solar and onshore wind than it is to do it with either coal or gas. And so, and, and nuclear, of course, too, are more expensive. So there has been a pivot in the power industry to uh, to, to renewables that's been very rapid. I think that uh, we, we need to put a lot more investment into that because it does take an upfront investment. It, it's true that when it came to some of the things we could do for the ozone layer, a lot of them were really, uh, it, we were getting rid of things that we didn't have a deep investment with. I mean, you know, how invested are you with your can of spray deodorant in your medicine cabinet? Probably not very. You know, you can throw it away and, and or maybe you can even use it until it runs out and then go out and buy a roll on. Right. Um, but but probably a lot of people went out and just bought the roll on because they figured it was a very good thing to do for the planet. But so so this is indeed a lot tougher because of our investment in existing infrastructure, some of which is tremendously expensive. But I don't think there's any real barrier to making the transition. And as soon as those things become, as soon as the alternatives become cheap enough, they essentially pay for themselves because energy drives everything. So if we can make energy uh, more cheaply with solar and wind, then um, the uh, cost of, of doing absolutely anything that requires energy becomes automatically cheaper too. And that, that makes a, a sort of a snowball effect of greater and greater demand. We need to make our grid more robust to things like uh, intermittency and able to transmit um, uh, electricity over broader spatial ranges. That is doable. It's not, it, you know, it's, other countries have already done it, actually. So it's not something we couldn't do. 
there's a, a lot of things that, uh, that are beginning to really happen quite quickly. And I'm very optimistic, we, but we do need some real changes in our existing infrastructure. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, so there's two things I would add. Uh, yeah, the first thing is the United States is now behind the rest of the world on barrier removal. So in Europe, you can use technology that's been in the market for five years now, absolutely proven safe and effective energy efficient, that's prohibited by the US EPA for use in the United States. So they are a wall against new technology where they used to be a door. And so somebody has to get in there and motivate and get approval. Can you give an example? Example, uh, there's a refrigerant called HFC32 that has a third of the uh, global warming potential. It has 20% higher energy efficiency. It's mildly flammable but it hasn't been improved in the United States. Similarly, there are natural refrigerants that have not been improved. And if you look at the timeline, another example, which is, is easy to understand, is they approved years ago, a decade or more ago, a chemical that has a GWP of less than one to replace HFC-134A, which has a GWP of 1300. This was allowed for light trucks and cars but the industry at that time did not apply for what's called highway trucks, the big trucks that move cargo, and off-road vehicles like farm tractors and construction equipment, mining equipment, forestry. And that uh, the industry applied months and months ago to have this used on their equipment. There's no difference in using it on off-road equipment or an on-road equipment or a big truck or a small truck because the cab of a big truck is about the same size as the interior of a car. But for some reason, the EPA has not finished that process, which is now way beyond the statutory limit of time. And they say it's because they just haven't had time to do it. Well, this is not acceptable. You have to have government moving at the pace of industry. And then the last thing, incredibly important, the United States military and military organizations all over the world were part of protecting the ozone layer. So far, that's not the case. If you look at inside at the documentation of military organizations, they say it's a, a force multiplier. It makes everything worse in national security. They say it's a it's an amplifier of conflict. There's tremendous concern about the displacement of populations and immigrants across borders and distractions from security because you have to do humanitarian relief. That's all in the documentation. But so far, all they do mostly is to do resiliency of their own facilities. So they're doing what they need to do to protect against the effects of climate change, but they haven't engaged yet in stopping climate change, which is much more cost effective. Uh, the last thing you want to do is let climate change happen and then try to run away and hide and build against it, because that's brutally, brutally expensive. So I think those two things, if we were more aggressive on approving new technology, and if we had the military organizations involved as part of the skill set and part of the solutions and so forth, I think we'd go a long way. As, as a final question here, um, uh, so Stephen, your, your panel, um, the technology and economic assessment panel, uh, was super successful in this strategic and coordination front on the technology and the replacement of the technology, which is something you were also just exploring. Does the does the Paris Climate Accord have anything similar? And do you see a, a panel like this as being something also that's crucial for, um, you know, the, the climate change crisis and also the, you know, the governance around other global catastrophic and existential risks? Yeah, I think you're right. And Susan and I have both tried over many years uh, to get the climate convention to do something like the TEAP. Uh, recently, I've realized that if you don't want to wait for the for the IPCC to do this, you could do it as a shadow TEAP. And that it's very easy, I think, for an individual sector to organize itself under the same principles of being objective and including members that have the coincidence of interest in changing the market and changing the technology. You could put that together within an industry and then bring forward the solutions that you'd like to see implemented. And this is almost happening in Europe right now. 
because they're phasing down HFCs much faster than the United States, and they're doing it on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, and they're involving the stakeholders. And the stakeholders have figured out that if they come to the EU with a single plan that cuts out their share of the goal, the, the European Union will approve that. If they come in with separate views and lots of disagreement, the EU will choose their own plan for them. So they have two choices, do it their way or do it the government's way. And so far, they always choose to do it the practical, uh, cost-effective uh, technology that they understand the best. And uh, it, it, that's exactly what the TEEP did. So I'm very enthusiastic about that model. And in fact, uh, that's where I, if I were an industry, that's where I would, would put my money right now, is I'd try to say, how do we become the leaders on this so that these activists that can cause mayhem in our company would say, no use messing with that company that Susan and Steve runs, let's go bother someone else. Uh, let's let them uh, solve their problems and we'll go on to a recalcitrant sector and uh, give them bloody hell. I think that's a very persuasive argument. All right, Stephen and Susan, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, if you have any final words for the audience about climate change, the, the ozone hole and existential risk, um, here is a, a space for you to share it. Well, I hope we've given you some hope in this uh, in this period uh, of uh, of talking. I mean, uh, it's easy to become kind of despondent about climate change because you know terrible events keep making people suffer day after day. On the other hand, I really do believe there's light at the end of the tunnel. I think the ozone issue demonstrates that, and I think we we are on the road to getting to uh, to a solution. Yeah, I would just add to that that organizations like uh, Future of Life Institute are a tremendous part of the solution. I do believe that recognition and explanation and and uh, all of those things make a div big difference to getting people motivated uh, to take on this very hard work. It's it's work you love when it's over, but it's always hard while you're doing it. So we have to have the highest motivation possible, and you folks are part of that solution. Well, thank you very much, Stephen and Susan, for, for coming on the podcast and also for your scientific and strategic coordinations to a, a global risk in, the, in, in our lifetimes. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much.